Right now on Black Girl Stuff. Black women have always been on the bottom of the pay scale, mm -hmm. and it continues to be an ongoing problem. Yes, mm -hmm. and in an interview that recently resurfaced with Viola Davis sparked a lot of conversation about the gender pay gap for black women. Let's take a look. What they're getting paid, which is half of what a man is getting paid, well, we get probably a tenth of what a Caucasian woman gets. Yes. And I'm number one on the call sheet. And then I have to go in and I have to hustle for my worth. Yeah. One of the, I mean, most amazing, most talented actresses in yes. the world, and you're hearing that directly from her. I mean, so let's dig into the comments and see what's happening. So a lot of people had a lot to say. Specifically, Dr. Denise Y. Most tweeted, pay black women their worth. Come on. Decrease the wage gap. Over $940,000 is the amount of money a black woman loses over the course of a 40-year career gap due to the wage gap. That's mm. so crazy. That's damn near a million dollars mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yes. You know how much you could do with a million dollars? There are some people out there that believe this wage gap is just a myth altogether. They don't even know what's going on. So we got to look at that. Yeah, people just don't believe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, racism isn't real either, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So on that note, I mean, do you think it's believed to be a myth because black women are not open about what they're making? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, what's, I, what's your take I on that? It's, people like to live in a bubble, like mm -hmm. you said, and mm -hmm. believe that we're so much further past these issues than what we really are. Yeah. And I think that's because they those people aren't the people directly affected by these Well, issues. I think that we don't really yeah. stick together a lot of times. No. When you find yourself in a corporate setting, there's this kind of crabs in a bucket mentality where people are like, oh, I'm not going to tell you how much I'm making because mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the boss and I'm going to sit here and I want to make more than you. But in fact, you have more bargaining power when everybody has the same Speak level up. of knowledge yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. education and so that when you have that education, you can go request more information based on the reality yes, of what's happening right. in your like, setting. And it's like it's not your so. money. It's the corporation's mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Let them share the dollars appropriately. I love that you said that because mm -hmm. I think in my corporate career, it's oftentimes the men, to be honest, my male friends, whether they be white, black, otherwise, they're the ones that have been super transparent with me about their pay. And oftentimes it was more. And they gave me the tools even, let's say, as I was getting into the negotiating rooms and thinking through whether or not I'm going to accept a job, they said, hey, sis, this is what I got in stock. This is what I got in pay. This is what I got in there. Whereas a lot of my black female co-workers were very much tight-lipped about that. And, you know, I think part of it is the reason because mm -hmm. we know as a community we're consistently told we're at the bottom of the totem pole with that. Mm -hmm. According to the Institute of Women's Policy Research, on average, black women in the U.S. are paid 42% less than white men and 21% less than white women. So it's not... It's, it's common. So we're fighting two fights. It's mm -hmm. like you have yeah. the gender yeah. wage gap, but yeah. then you mm -hmm. also have a racial wage yeah. gap. Yeah. Well, yeah, black yeah. women find themselves at this interesting cross-section of sexism and racism. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I look at Serena Williams because she's been very vocal about the pay gap mm -hmm. when it comes to black women, and she really encourages black women to get together and discuss these things so that you're making it easier for the next generation of black women to come mm -hmm. in and they don't have to deal with the same things. Yeah, and exactly. I think that's a part of keeping the door open, mm -hmm. right, for future generations and making their lives easier, and we all have a responsibility to, to do, do that. And I speaking of responsibility, yeah. I would, would like to encourage our allies in black and white women mm -hmm. to also pull us up because they understand, being women, that mm -hmm. it is a gap even for them with gender. You look at the well, film industry, I think that, I mean, Jessica Chastain, mm -hmm. I love her, she's an amazing actress, and she did the same thing for Octavia Spencer and said, hold up now, yeah. you're not about yeah. to be paying her all this little bit, you know, yeah. and she's the lead actress, right? right? She's the star of the show, and she's like, listen, she brought her star power to the table and demanded demanded better pay for her black female you know counterpart. And I yeah. respect I like that. We were raised, raised, mm -hmm. as in the black community, we were raised to uh, not pocket watch and like mind your business. It's always yeah. keep your financial business to yourself. Yeah. But I feel like if in your career wise, yeah. you know, don't tell your business or your financial business to just anyone, not just a random person, but you know who your ally mm -hmm. is. I feel like yeah. if you are doing something, you should know. If somebody's doing what you do, you should know how much they're getting paid for. That's yeah. so, you not, so you don't short yourself. We need to talk about a solution, right? Yes. And what ways we can actually close mm -hmm. this wage gap and so you gave some I mean Brie what do you think? I think that we need to be teaching each other yeah. how to negotiate the pay. I think we need more people in HR positions that can be advocates for us in these in, when we're going through you know interviews mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I do think it kind of goes back into mm -hmm. what we as black women might be taught to do like loyalty really mm -hmm. stay what you are be grateful for the fact that someone's giving you an opportunity and I think for me when it comes to even luxury things or just mm -hmm. jobs in general I think we have to fight the notion of like 
succumbing to the idea that you have to stay. Yeah. You don't have to be you there. Don't have to. We talking mm -hmm. about ride or die re with relationships, but that goes for jobs too. You do not have to be there, and oftentimes your pay up will happen when you decide to leave a company and you decide to go somewhere el else. Like you said, know your worth. You don't have to make it work, and let, it's time for us to put, hold these companies accountable. When you're interviewing for these positions, ask the company. You can, you know, they ask mm -hmm. you, do you have any questions? Yeah. I'm, I think we. It's time for us to say, yeah. what are your mm -hmm. incentives mm -hmm. for Black women? How are you guys investing and being transparent and open mm -hmm. about the pay? And gap. literally ask yeah. the range. Yes. Yes. What is the range? All of, us, <laughs> all, of us, all of us need to hold these companies accountable. Although I do think that it is really difficult for mothers, single Black okay. mothers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. eighty percent of Black women are the primary, sole, or co-breadwinners, mm -hmm. and so just uh, you know. Actually, fair wage is the yeah. difference between uh, what living Education. paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. and sustaining your entire mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like I know a lot of people say, "Well, you can just leave," but I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of people find themselves trapped. I mean, think about Georgia, seven twenty-five minimum wage here. Yes. What's that coming out to? Barely fifteen thousand yeah. dollars a year. Like, what the hell can you really do with that? Mm -hmm. We also need to take it right to our local governments and say, yes. "Hey, yeah, turn it to fifteen dollars, and that still ain't enough." No, but not. we can get into this, guys. I think we're all here for Black women being paid okay. lots yes. more. Okay. Yes. Wait, hold on, hold on. I feel you, mama. <laughs> <laughs> that was our next guest surprising his mom with a bucket full of pans, y'all. Armani White, welcome to the BGS house. Yes. Hey, how everybody? She, she fell out after that video. I would've fell out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Mom, you know, you're on the street. Like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it was crazy. No, seriously, Armani, that video was so touching. How did it feel to be able to, like, bless your mom mm -hmm. like that? I mean, she blessed me. You know, she, like, she got me my right. first microphone growing wow. up, so it was like paying for... You know, like, you ever be in Chick-fil-A line and then you pay for the car behind you? Yeah. It felt like yes. that times... 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. I feel like a lot of rappers, or you've seen throughout the throughout their years when they first yeah. come up, whether they buy their mom a new car, a new yeah. house, yeah. drop some bands. Like, do you feel like there's an added pressure, especially for like black sons, to provide for their moms? Mm. Um, yes, and my mom. Like, so my mom, she kind of gave me what the definition of hard work was. You know, she was a single parent. Mm -hmm. Like she did all of the ancillaries that like, you know, I guess if, if it was a two parent household, she did all of those things. So it only just felt like the right thing to do in principle. You know, it wasn't just like a, uh, you know, I, like I'm a rapper now, so I gotta do That's this thing. Right. Like it was like, nah, this makes sense to do. And this is what I wanna do. This is things like, even when I started rapping, I thought about like that moment when I'm able to take care of her. That's when I actually made it. Okay. You know? Right, yeah. I mean, I mean going to the bank to get all of that money. And that was a whole separate yeah. process. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the, the teller in the back, like, you know, teller's job is to show you how much money is going in. but. In Philly, so like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling her how much money, and she's like, okay, we got twenty thousand here, we got another twenty. <laughs> 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 Looking like a mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was bad, but uh, but it worked out. I feel like you're yeah. just such a family man, or that's kind of what we've seen. Yeah. Um, but you also have been very vocal about your, you know, your relationship on and off relationship. I would say with your late father. Like, yeah. what was that relationship like? How do you feel now? Just tell us a little bit more about that journey to to healing. So it wasn't necessarily just about my father. I, uh, and 10 years prior to losing my father, I lost my aunt uh, oh, wow. and, and my three cousins in a house fire. And I was like, mm. we grew up in that home. Mm. So uh, like I was, a lot of times I was tied to traumatic experience. I was tied to loss. Uh, that's kind of why I created this happy hood music yeah. thing. It's just like, you know, it's a lot of happy music that's born out of pain. But uh, with my father specifically, I learned obedience from him. It was a lot of things that he told me, that he said to me, and I was like, hey, whatever, God. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was a lot of things that once he passed away, I just sat back, really reflected, and things like that. And I was like, oh, this makes sense. But it was, you know, it was hard for at a moment because it wasn't, there was just that moment that you couldn't really be like, hey, I get it now. You know, yeah. that we couldn't have that conversation of understanding anymore. So, um, you know, now it's, it's not, it, I guess the funerals kind of teach you to not, uh, more in the death, but to celebrate the life. So like every move, everything I do now, I feel like he's with me. He's part of the, you know, he's part of his interview right now. Right. In that little couch in the, in the corner okay. right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah. Yeah. But with that, like you said, going through the house fire, losing yeah. your father, and a lot of black people in our community, we don't talk about grieving and like what that process looks like. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you ever got a chance to really grieve, or how do you heal from these experiences to still be happy to create happy music? But that's the thing, like, we don't have a, there's no definition of, like, you know, just 
growing up in Philadelphia is a rough city. You mm -hmm. kind of, like, you were just kind of instilled to have, like, it's like a dog mentality. It was like, yo, you got to stand up taller than whatever it is that just knocked you down. So you don't really get a real moment to kind of process what's going on around you. Um, and there's no real, like, I did grief counseling. I did all of the things that they're, you're okay. supposed to do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that really tells you how to do it. There's no, there's no right way to do these things. You just kind of have to, like, you know, learn your own process as you, as you right. go along. And um, I'm happy to say that I did heal. Like, I did take that time. I did, like, kind of separate. When my father passed, I moved to, uh, there was a moment I just couldn't be in Philadelphia. Like, it mm -hmm. just, it just, it, I, I couldn't be around it. I couldn't go back home. I couldn't go back to my neighborhood. So I just moved to California. I went to LA and I just, like, I did healing. Like, I wasn't even making music. I was just going on Run Your King. And I was like an IG baddie wow. every morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going there. I was taking, yeah, yeah. 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 That's a hard ass yeah. These that's IG hard baddies hard be healing. Yeah. I didn't even know. Like, <laughs> I was living a soft life, so I was like, <laughs> I love um, that you say the I soft life that. as a black man, because I feel like a lot of times we talk about it from a black woman perspective, but right. you, you're open to it then. No, I, I, everything, like there's such a, what do they call it, uh, what's the word, these toxic masculinity? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 like, like I kind of feel like everything I do is just breaking the bear. I got polka dots on, I got my hair in little balls. You're fine. Yeah, yeah, like these that. things are just like, you know, the other guy's like, I ain't doing all that. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, that, that machismo, I just kind of, I don't know, like, I just felt like at the very beginning, at the at the the earliest stage of this, I was like, or I could just be myself. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's so interesting because when you look at hip-hop right now, I mean, you've talked about this before, it mm -hmm. either comes off as like you've got the, you know, male aggressive hip-hop or yeah. you've got the melodic hip-hop, but yours is kind of like a crossbreed. And when we yeah. talk about Billie Eilish, yeah. you know, <laughs> topping U.S. Yeah. trends and TikTok back in August, yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah doing numbers yeah all right uh -huh. crazy streams and then of course you have your new song diamond dallas uh -huh. yeah all right yes you got to tell yeah, us yeah. what the inspiration was behind that um so diamond dallas was uh it was kind of for me it was like the soundtrack of like you know the thing is i was just having this conversation i climb i feel like every day i'm climbing a mountain i'm climbing a mountain i don't never really look back and say Oh, man, we 8,000 feet up. Like, <laughs> I just keep climbing. But Diamond Dallas was the first time I came back home and I was recognized. And like, wow. you know, like I had a store, I have a storage unit back home. And like the guy that works at U-Haul is like, yo, like I'm like, <laughs> oh, I gotta put my hood, like, you know. But it was the, it was, it was just kind of like the soundtrack to that tie-in of like, okay, I'm no longer just little Jeep Jeep from the neighborhood. Yeah. Like I'm Armani White now. Like, and people regard me as Armani White or Big Blanco or whatever it is that I'm going by. But uh, that was, yeah, that's what that's what that moment was. But how do you think your music is different from a lot of the other artists that are out here? This is the thing that about hip hop that I started to realize the pattern. We sell trauma, we sell pain to each yes. other. We, you know, we continuously tell these dark, these horrid, these, these you know, traumatizing stories. And I was like, well, I went through a lot of trauma in my life. Why don't I find a different way to explain this, why don't I find a different way to cater and give this to people? Yeah, yeah. I love that. And so, so I, you know, I found this happy hood music is more or less me kind of saying like, okay, I'm talking about the same yeah. things, but I'm finding a brighter way. And you've got the support of Def Jam, obviously yeah. being signed to label. Congratulations! Thank you, thank this you. past Absolutely. July, thank you. right? A lot of young people who are starting out who want to be rappers. I mean, they they see the end result and they're like, oh, I want to be instantly famous. But right. you've been at this for a long time, and I think a lot of people don't understand all of the work that goes into it. So I definitely applaud well, you for that. Well, see, See, that's the thing I want to touch on is like, there was a moment where we all said, you should be independent. And it didn't really make sense for everybody. Like for me, I was independent for so long until I got a record like Billie Eilish. I said, I can't do this alone. You understand? Mm -hmm. I, needed, I needed a partnership. I needed a, a team. And so, I, you know, I got together with Def Jam. In that regard, I walked into Def Jam and said, the only way I'll do this deal is if I'm going to be regarded as a partner, if we're going to yes. do a partnership deal. Now, I tell that to a lot of the young artists coming up, like, yo, you should want to be a part, you know, you should want to fight for the partnership, fight to be at a partner level. Yeah. Understand, though, you're not going to walk in there and get the deal, Armani White guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, okay. But it's okay, it's okay, because there's another deal that I couldn't walk in and yeah. get. Right, but you, yes. have to, you have to take what you can get and maximize the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so... I that love was, that yeah. message. Well, we appreciate Thank you so much, so much Armani, for stopping by the BGS house.